and welcome back to tutorial. In the last part, I made a new mechanic for my videos game called Pepper Pelt, which is very similar to the Shadow Mario, or Shadow Celeste, or other similar mechanics in other videos games where a duplicate of the main character is created, which copies the character's previous movements, previous animations, and will kill the player if they touch it. I thought best to make a tutorial about this system because it was very simple to implement, and that would be more interesting to show off the actual mechanic in-game. The first thing I'm going to do is create a game object for our spawner of our shadow characters. This is just an empty game object with the script of the shadow spawners attached to it. I then need to make a version of the character that this is going to be copying. For this, all I did is I copied the visual component of my player character and created a new component as a child of the shadow spawner, which is just this visual component of the player character. I also attached a collider to this, but this is just going to be dependent on however you handle hazards within your game. I'm also going to attach an animator to our shadow duplicate. This is just going to control the actual animations that it plays. You can have this as a copy of your actual player animator if you would like, but depending on the system you've set up for your animator, for your player animator, you may want to use a unique version of this. What I did is I made a new animator component for this shadow duplicate, and what I did is I copied every single animation that is in my regular player character, and I just put all of these as a new animation in a new component. None of these new transitions transitional information based on how the script is going to handle playing these animations, all they need to do is match the actual name of the animation that is used by your player. So if you're just dragging these from the inspector of your player character where you keep your animations into this new animator, this is all you will need to do. After this, I'm also going to make a new game object which is going to be the effect that is going to be created whenever this actual component creates a new shadow character to mask the fact that the player is popping in to the game. This is not mandatory at all, this is just something I like to do to make the visuals for this system a little bit more interesting. Next we're going to assign all the values for our shadow character in our shadow character script. My version of this is called Shadow Pep because my game is called Pep Pal. For this, I'm going to have a reference to our player character. I have a reference to the actual scripting I use for my player character, but realistically, all you need is the actual transform or the game object for your player character. We're going to have a public value for the delay before start. This is when the actual system is going to be creating our double. So unless you want your double to be created at the exact moment the game starts, we need a little delay for this. We'll have a private float for actual delay. This is just going to be counting our time before we start the scripting. We're going to have a list of a class called position info, and we're going to make this class in a moment. And this is going to be a new list of position info. This is going to handle all of our player positioning, rotations, animations, things like this. We're going to have a new game object for our shadow object. This is the object we just created in our inspector, where the player character is going to be duplicated as a shadow. We're also going to have a reference to its animator called shadow anim. We're going to have a private rule for created. This is to handle the actual creation effect of the visuals. We're going to have a reference for the creation effect, the one we just created in the inspector again. And we're going to have a private string for saved animation. This is going to handle whatever the character's shadow version animation is currently playing. Next, we're going to create a new class information for our position information. This is going to be a system serializable, so we can actually use it. It's going to have a value for a vector free, the position, a quaternion for the rotation, and a vector free for the scale. These are just going to handle a position rotation scale of a player character whenever they are moving. We're also going to have a public animation clip for the actual animation that the current player is performing. So. When running, this would feed back the run animation. When idling, this would feed back the idle animation, etc, etc. Just whatever animation the player is currently playing in a specific frame that we can copy in our shadow scripting. In our start function, we're going to find a reference to our player character. I do this by finding the object with the tagged player and then getting the component of player movement. Essentially, this is just the easy way of finding our player character in screen. If your player character does not have the tag of player, it's not going to find the actual player character. So you just need to set this to find a game object of whatever tag your character is tagged as, and make sure nothing else is tagged with this same tag, otherwise you may find the wrong object. 
Then within our fixed update, we're going to create a new position information called pause new. For this position information, we're going to register its position as the player's currently transform position, its rotation as the player's transform rotation, its scale as the player's transform's local scale, and its animation as whatever the player animation current animation clip is. So just whatever the actual animation a current player is playing. We're going to then take our player positions list. We're going to add this new position to this list. What we're going to do then is wait for our delay function to run. This is basically going to stop this actual function of the scripting from doing anything else until our delay has ticked down. So we're not going to do anything with our shadow component, we're not going to do anything at all, we're just going to register player positions and return from this script, provided that actual delay is less than delay before start. If this is happening, we're going to tick up our delay by delta time, which means this value is going to increase over time, and if we're not exceeding the actual delay time, we're going to return from this function. If when the actual delay time is ticked over the delay before start in this function, we're going to turn on our objects and create our components that are going to give the visual information and have the actual object that places the player turned on. So we're going to take our shadow object, we're going to set it active to true, we're going to set its position to whatever the first position in the list of player positions is, and this is going to be done with a set shadow position void function, which we're going to create later. And we're then going to create our actual visual effect to correspond with the creation of this object. So we're going to instantize our creation effect at the same player position as the shadow position is going to be placed at. So wherever our player initially was, we're going to set this to quaternion identity, and we're going to set this new object to true. So we're going to create the effect as soon as the shadow object is also being turned on. After this function, provided that the actual delay time has exceeded our wait time, we're going to be able to run the actual function. So all we're going to do here is we're going to check what the current player position is, and for this we're going to create a new position info called set info, and this is going to be the first component in our player positions list. We're going to run a function called set shadow position with the function of set info. We're going to run a function called set shadow animations with the value of set info, and then we're going to remove this value from our list. What these functions do is set shadow pause, is going to set our shadow's position, rotation, and scale to whatever the player's position, rotation, and scale are, and then the set shadow animations is going to copy the actual player's animation and make the shadow play the same animation. Then, once all of these have happened, we're going to remove the first object in our player positions list, because this is the, the position that our shadow has already been set to, animated to, and therefore is not needed anymore, so we can remove this from our list, so our list is being cleared out as our shadow is moving to each individual new position. In our set shadow pause void function, what we're going to do is we're going to take the shadow object's transform position, make it the same as set info position. We're going to take our shadow object transform rotation, make it the same as set info rotation. We're going to take the same value of our shadow object transform local scale and set it to the set info scale. So the values that we have recorded from our player at the beginning of this function and every single frame is going to be set to our shadow object. Basically, all this is doing is copying our player's information from whatever they were doing, however long our delay was. So if we had a delay of one second, this is going to be copying whatever our player was doing and wherever they were positioned one second ago. Next, in our set shadow animations function, we're going to check that the set info animation does not equal null, preventing your animator always has an animation that it will play at every instance. This really doesn't need to occur, but on the off chance that your animator for your player character is missing an animation, or you just don't find an animation, we'll have this set to null, so the function does not result in any errors. Next, we're going to check if the seed animation has the same name as our set info animation name. This basically is checking if our shadow animation is playing this animation already, so we don't have to trigger the animation again. For example, if your character was running in one frame and then the next frame they're still running, we don't need to continuously tell our shadow animation to play the run animation because they already will be doing so. If these values are different, we're going to set our saved animation to equal to the new set information animation name. So the next frame, this saved animation value will already be equal to the set information animation name if the same animation is playing in the next frame. Then all we're going to do is tell our shadow animation to play this new animation. 
finally, at the end of this entire scripting, we're going to add a value for the player positions to remove the position at point zero. As explained earlier, this is just removing the first position of the player positions list because these are the values that we have already set as shadow to be positioned at and animated with. So this value is no longer needed and in the next frame we can progress up the amount of lists of our player position. Going back into the inspector, I'll make sure all of these values for the shadow component are assigned correctly, assigning the actual shadow object and the shadow object animator correctly, assigning the creation effect correctly, and then creating the animator for the shadow component. As I mentioned earlier, all I'm doing here is creating a new animation animator, and then I'm dragging and dropping every single animation that my player character has, and therefore will be playing, into this new animator. I'm not renaming these because the animation component and the way it transitions is based on the original name of the animation clips and therefore the the states in the animator will have to match the clips name. Unfortunately this was the easiest method I have for this which means that issues with animation blending that the player component can have where you can have one animation blend to another based on your animation state can cause an issue when being copied by another animator because the Unity scripting makes it difficult to find the name of the actual state the animator is currently active within. Especially if one has an animator which has over 100 animations, like my animator. So the easiest solution I had for this is to just make a new animator, drag and drop all of the animations you currently would require for your animator, and attach this to your shadow object, and then keep your regular animations for your player character. Next, I'll create the creation effect for whenever we are creating this object. This is a very simple effect I have. I just have a few overlaying smoke effects and a swirling effect and a portal audio that plays. Essentially, this is just a nice little particle effect that plays to obscure the fact that the character is popping into existence. One thing you could have is perhaps if you would like your shadow clone to create an animation when they are created, you could have the animation component ignored for a certain number of frames as the shadow component is animating itself being created, but the method I found that I preferred best for my game is to just make a visual particle effect that is going to obscure the fact that the shadow object is being created within one frame and they are popping into existence. And that is all you need for your shadow clone component, baby. It is a very, very simple component. It is not a whole lot of complexity to it. To sum up, we just get the player's position, rotation, and scale every single frame, along with their animation, and we make a new object copy this data. This version of the shadow clone was created in 2D, but there is absolutely no difference to creating it in 3D, because as you can tell, I use a vector free for the positioning of the shadow clone, so if you want to create this same system in 3D, you can do just that. There's not going to be any difference, because the rotation and transform values are going to be kept the exact same. So, you can put this in a 3D game, a 2D game, a 1D game, you can do whatever you want. If you want to have this actually damage your player, it is dependent on your player controller, but all I do is I add a circle collider to all my shadow clones, and then a scripting for hazard components, and all this does is make it damage the player when you touch them. In summary, I think this is a very fun component and mechanic to use in games. A lot of games use this mechanic, and for obvious reasons, it's very, very fun to have an object that copies your exact movement that you have to play against. It makes a mechanic where you have to think more heavily about your player's movements because a hazard object is going to copy those exact movements and you may be creating an issue for your future self by moving in specific ways or doing specific things in levels. If you're watching this video because it's a tutorial and not my regular devlogs because my devlogs don't get a lot of views. You should probably check out my devlogs where I cover extensive detailing on how I code every single minute aspect of my video's game, Pep Pellington, aka Pep Pell, aka The Disaster Master, aka The Big Girl's Day Out.